Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Wadley. I want to thank you all for joining today's member webinar, Genetic Testing and in Individuals with a Cerebral Palsy. We encourage questions to be asked throughout the presentation. And as a courtesy to our presenter, all attendees have been muted. Please utilize the Zoom Q&A box for questions that you may have throughout the talk. And the chat function is also available for discussion throughout this presentation. Questions will be read aloud during the last 10 minutes of our webinar. The learning objectives for today's talk are, classify clinical features of genetic and non-genetic forms of cerebral palsy or CP, identify different genes involved in CP, integrate current genetic research on CP into practice, evaluate appropriate genetic testing workup for patients with CP, and discuss emotional implications of a genetic diagnosis in a patient with CP. Today, we are joined by our speaker, Haley May, and a little bit about Haley. She's a genetic counselor at the Institute for Genomic Medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and a faculty member at the Department of Medicine who specializes in cerebral palsy genetics and genomics. She collaborates with the Weinberg Family Cerebral Palsy Center in the Department of Orthopedics at CUIMC and has most recently published genetic testing in individuals with cerebral palsy, a cohort study describing the diagnostic rates in patients with and without known environmental etiologies for CP. Thank you so much for giving this talk. I'll hand it over to you, Haley. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. I'm excited to be here and really honored to be invited to speak on the genetics of cerebral palsy. Um, like Alex said, I've been privileged enough to uh, partner with the Weinberg Family Cerebral Palsy Center at Columbia, where I've worked with some amazing, amazing neurologists um, and been just so fortunate to learn so much about cerebral palsy genetics. And so I'm excited to share with you. I will share the research that we did at Columbia um, later on in the presentation, but I'm gonna start with just a background of cerebral palsy, what we know about the genetics of cerebral palsy in general, and then incorporate our research into the current field. And so to start, what is cerebral palsy? This is the definition um, that is in the literature that is a standard definition as of 2006. and this is actually something that I keep going back to, this definition of cerebral palsy, because once you understand how cerebral palsy is defined, it really helps you to understand the genetics of cerebral palsy. And so I have highlighted here or bolded some of the terms that I think are the most important from the definition. And so let me just review them with you. Cerebral palsy describes a group of permanent disorders. And I highlighted permanent here because cerebral palsy is due to usually damage to the brain that's either done either prenatally, um, during birth or postnatally. And so this damage is an insult to the brain that is from birth and it's not something that's usually treatable because this damage has been done. Similarly, I have highlighted or bolted non-progressive here and that's for the same reason. And it's because this insult to the brain has happened either prenatally, during birth, or postnatally. And so once that damage to the brain has been done, we don't expect the disorder to progress further. So cerebral palsy is something where you see symptoms usually from birth, right after birth, and you don't see it um, progressing in severity. It's something where the movement disorder, uh, yeah, it's, it's already done from birth due to this damage. It causes activity limitation. And so these are uh, limitations that are inhibiting activities of daily living in these patients. And again, it's a disturbance in the developing fetal or infant brain. It affects about one in 500 live births in the US. The currently well-characterized causes of cerebral palsy are environmental risk factors or environmental etiologies. This is just some of them. These are particularly the ones that we use as criteria in our research. Um, they're also the ones that have been used in some other major papers that have come out recently. So the first is prematurity um, and specifically extreme prematurity born before 32 weeks gestational age, interventricular hemorrhage or stroke, 
intrauterine infection, major brain malformations, and birth asphyxia. Cerebral palsy is classified two different ways. There's first a physiologic classification and then a distribution classification. And so the first, the physiologic classification is going to tell you the phenotype and where that damage to the brain has occurred. And so the different types are spastic cerebral palsy, dyskinetic and ataxic. They can also have a mixed type. So for example, if a patient has spastic cerebral palsy, we know that the damage to the brain from birth was happening in the motor cortex. The second classification, the distribution tells you where the movement um, is affected. And so in monoplegia, it's only affecting one limb. In hemiplegia, it's affecting one side of the body, either usually either the left or right side. In diaplegia, it's affecting either both arms or both legs. And in quadriplegia, it's affecting all four limbs of the body. And some evaluations for CP, um, the first three are really focused on assessing the severity of the movement disorder, whether that be the patient's ability to sit, walk, whatever stage that they're at. And these are really important because it gives us a way to see how the patient's movement is changing over time, if at all, with a standardized score. And so the first one is the one that we had used in our study. Um, this is the one that is generally used in orthopedics at Columbia. This is the GMFCF score which stands for Gross Motor Function Classification System. This is a score of one through five, one being the least severe, five being the most severe. Um, and again, this is just a way to try and understand how the movement is changing. It also gives us an idea of the outcome and the trajectory of the patient's movement disorder. And then of course, some of these other evaluations are standard. I'm including an MRI and a CT scan. And now onto the really exciting part. So I have here that CP has about a 40% heritability rate. So I pulled this article from 1990. Um, I really try and understand historical perspective when I am trying to understand things. I think it's just really helpful um, to know the history behind what people are thinking. And so way back in 1990, well, I say way back, it's not that long ago, but it's long ago considering that there hasn't been genetic testing done standardly on cerebral palsy patients um, or in general uh, since 1990. So even then they had an idea that cerebral palsy seemed inherited, genetic, familial in some way. So obviously there was a hunch that people that were related had higher instances um, of cerebral palsy or to be affected. And so just a reminder that 40% heritability rate does not mean that 40% of patients with CP have a genetic cause. Again, uh, this is heritability rate. So it's, it's saying that the variation of this trait, in this case, it's cerebral palsy, is due to genetic variation 40% of the time. And so Dr. Pedersen, in 1990 calculated this by doing twin studies. And as we know, we do twin studies because we expect, we expect monozygotic twins to have a higher concordance rate of a certain trait if it is genetic because they share the same DNA. So with a significant p-value, um, Dr. Pedersen calculated that CP has about a 40% heritability rate based on twin studies. So I just thought that was, this was really striking um, that for a while we've really had an idea that CP has a genetic cause of some sort or it's affected by genetics. And I haven't seen any studies that have really recalculated this. Um, if anybody's wondering, this is obviously from 1990. I haven't seen a, a newer study calculating heritability rate specifically. And now for the question that I know most people here must have is what is the percentage of CP that's genetic? you know, what is the diagnostic rate when you do genetic testing? And so you can see, I have here that's five to 65%. It's all over the map. And I'll explain why in a second. This is something that I can definitely dive into. But before anybody gets 
scared that five to 65 percent just doesn't make sense and it's such a large spectrum i do want to tell you that there is um, an accepted diagnostic rate which is about 14 percent so i will explain why this is such a variety um, in studies out there but when you take away a couple of the studies here that are really extreme in their methodology i'll say and, and i'll explain that in a second and you take the other studies that are more consistent and if you take the mean, median, in mode of all of those studies, the diagnostic rate, um, or I'm sorry, the mean, median, mode diagnostic rate is about 14% across the board. Um, so it's pretty consistent. And also major labs out there do report a diagnostic rate of about 14%. And we'll say that about 14% of CP is genetic. So that is what's accepted, um, just so you're wondering. So why are the studies so different, why is it 5% to 65%? Well, first I'm going to take the bottom two, these super high diagnostic rates. So this is the 52.9% and the 65%, um, which I, most of us know that this is way over the diagnostic rate for most genetic testing, especially like, certainly for whole exome sequencing. And these are all um, next generation sequencing based studies that I'm talking about here. So these last two with the really high diagnostic rates, first of all, they're extremely small cohorts. Um, one is, I think, less than 10 patients. One is less than 20. So they're very small, which definitely skews it. Second of all, they're all pediatric. So certainly in cerebral palsy, which I think is consistent with other uh, manifestations, pediatric um, diagnostic rate is going to be a lot higher than the diagnostic rate in adults. Third of all, um, some of these patients, at least on one of these studies, I'm not sure which, were required to have intellectual disability or developmental delay in addition to their cerebral palsy. And so we know also, and I'll describe this more later, but we do know that there's a correlation between a positive diagnostic rate in patients with CP who also have a developmental delay or intellectual disability. And finally, and this is a really important point to take home, um, these two studies, and these aren't the only ones in this list, but these two definitely were a selective cohort. So these were only looking at patients who had no environmental risk factor or no environmental etiology for their CP. So they did not have birth asphyxia or prematurity or hemorrhage or stroke or any of the things that we looked at before. They had essentially no reason for CP and it was only limited and selected to those patients. So once you look at all of these factors um, and put them all together, you're going to get a, a very high diagnostic rate. And so when you kind of take out these last two that are really extreme in their cohort, this is where the mean, median, and mode is 14%. I wanna point out um, that study by Moreno de Luca at all 2021 also is much higher than the rest. Um, that is the biggest study out there right now. It's over 1300 participants and it was also using um, data from GeneDx. Was a, this was a collaboration with I believe Geisinger and Gene DX. And so even in this study, the 29.5% is a accumulated, I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for, but diagnostic rate when you average out or look at the trios and the non-trios for this study, the trios were um, as expected, a lot higher of a diagnostic rate than the non-trios and the pediatric patients were a much higher diagnostic rate than the adult. But when you put them together, they got a 29.5% diagnostic rate, um, which is quite high. And so this is explaining why it's so inconsistent, um, but at the moment, the accepted rate is about 14%. And so what are some genetic causes of cerebral palsy? I have broken this down by the phenotypes of cerebral palsy. I felt like this was a helpful way to look at it. If you do see patients in clinic and you notice the type of CP that they have and maybe can think about what genetic diagnoses might be behind them. And so in patients with spastic CP, where of course you're gonna see spasticity, um, a possible genetic etiology is hereditary spastic paraplegia. And I'm gonna skip over this for now, but I'm going to spend 
a lot of time talking about hereditary spastic paraplegia because it's a really important one in this patient population. Arginase deficiency, which is a urea cycle disorder, multiple carboxylase deficiency, which is a biotin dependent enzyme disorder. If you're seeing patients with dyskinetic CP, this is going to include patients with um, chorea, dystonia. We're looking at, of course, um, any syndromes with hyperkinetic movement disorders, uh, neurotransmitter disorders, for example, catecholamine deficiency, inborn errors of metabolism, organic acid disorders, creatine, creatine disorders. If we move on to ataxic CP, where you're going to see ataxia, um, you may expect to see GLUT1 deficiency syndrome, ataxia telangiectasia, um, disorders of the glycosylation, metabolic disorders, mitochondrial disorders are really good examples for ataxic CP. And so as promised, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into spastic paraplegia. This is because, again, hereditary spastic paraplegia is one of the most common genetic etiologies for CP out there. It has about 20 to 30 genes associated with it. So it's a pretty wide range of genotypes and phenotypes. So the hereditary spastic paraplegias are a group of neurodegenerative disorders that present with spasticity, usually starting in the lower extremities. And the primary distinguishing characteristic between a hereditary spastic paraplegia and a CP of an environmental etiology is going to be that worsening spasticity. So remember that at the beginning, I was highlighting the importance of the definition of CP and what makes, um, what makes a CP diagnosis a clinical diagnosis. And so we remember that in cerebral palsy with an environmental etiology as it is currently accepted, we do not expect to see worsening or regression. So the fact that the spasticity is worsening should be a red flag for a hereditary spastic paraplegia. Um, and then of course, if you don't see a environmental history, that's another reason, um, just an extra reason to think that it may be a genetic etiology. Hereditary spastic paraplegias can also be complex. So they can include other neurologic impairments, including seizures, intellectual disability, dementia, or peripheral neuropathy. I wanted to mention this just because I really didn't want anybody to be thrown off by the fact that a patient with hereditary spastic paraplegia may have these other manifestations as well. It's not necessarily just spasticity or CP. And so here we are. Um, these are the genes that were listed in our 2021 paper that came out of Columbia. And this is about a little over 100 cerebral palsy genes. Really, I think there's been about over 300 that have been associated with cerebral palsy. Um, I thought I would take this moment to kind of point out that one of the interesting things about understanding whether there's a genetic etiology for CP, I have read that although obstetric practices and birth practices have gotten safer over time, um, cerebral palsy instances have not really gone down. So this is a really interesting stat, I thought, um, and another reason to understand that there must be some more underlying genetic etiology here. And so I just thought this was a really nice visualization of all of these genes that have been associated with cerebral palsy and a nice segue into the next part, which is talking more about the genes um, that have been discovered so far. And so taking all of the literature, and this is the literature that I had cited on the page with the diagnostic rate data, these are the genes that we see the most often um, that I have been, that I was able to find that have been published. And so this is our top 10. Um, I thought this would be fun to do, you know, at the end of 2021, I got top 10 music that I was listening to and top 10 fitness routines that I was doing. And so I thought this was a really nice little summation of uh, the genes out there, the top 10. And so the first one, let's do it, is CTNNB1. 
and there's been over 20 cases. And so, you know, as we know in genetics, um, where some of these diseases can be quite rare, the fact that there has been 20 to 25 cases, um, and really we've only been doing serious genetic testing on cerebral palsy patients for a few years, I think is quite significant. And so CTNNB1 is the most reported gene. COL4A1 is the second at 10 to 15 cases. There's 10 reported cases of KIF1A. This is one of those hereditary spastic paraplegia genes. We see GNAL1 quite often, um, which is related to the GNAL1 encephalopathies. MECP2, KCNQ2, STXBP1, 201A, SPAST, which is another hereditary spastic paraplegia gene, and L1 CAM. So these are the 10. Um, I took the top five and I just narrowed it down a little bit more um, and decided that it might be nice to talk about the top five that are out there because these are things that you might see. Um, and it's just interesting to see what things have been associated so far. And so that top one where we had seen over 20 cases, and by the way, this is that I could find reported in the literature, that doesn't mean that there aren't more cases out there um, that I didn't capture or that aren't in the literature yet. So CTNNB1, you may expect to see in a patient with spastic CP. It is associated with neurodevelopmental disorder with spastic diaplegia and visual defects. And so you'll see spasticity coupled with retinal abnormalities, intellectual disability, language disorders, behavioral problems, dystonia, and microcephaly. The treatment for this is just the treatment of symptoms. There's no um, cure. The next most often, the call for a one you may see in patients with dyskinetic CP, ataxic, um, or other mixed. And so in this one, you see small vessel brain disease with or without ocular anomalies. And so clinically, the small vessel brain disease can manifest as an infantile hemiparesis, seizures, hemorrhagic stroke. And so, you know, I just want to point out here, it's interesting that this one is um, different in that the col 4 a one may actually be causing that interventricular hemorrhage that you see that we feel may have been a birth trauma, but um, in fact, it could be due to this col a one mutation. Uh, this is going to be treatment of symptoms and avoidance of anticoagulant medications. KIF1A, the next is a hereditary spastic paraplegia gene. Again, this is spastic paraplegia type 30 is autosomal dominant and recessive, and you see hereditary spastic paraplegia as well as optic nerve atrophy, mild intellectual disability, and epilepsy. And this is treatment of symptoms. GNAO1, you may see in dyskinetic CP. Again, this is associated with that um, epileptic encephalopathy. This is really considered a spectrum of disorders um, or GNAO1 encephalopathy where you can see um, the chorea, of course, where we can expect in dyskinetic CP, variable intellectual disability, epileptic encephalopathy, structural brain abnormalities, um, and the treatment of symptoms are for really for the chorea, which might be tetrabenazine and deep brain stimulation. And finally, MECP2, um, I, I think we all know this one, which is associated with Rett syndrome, which is of course in females, it is excellent dominant and characterized by normal psychomotor development followed by a regression, the repetitive hand movements, gait ataxia, tremors, seizures, and autistic behaviors. And this is something that um, a, lot of, a lot of us probably wouldn't associate with cerebral palsy, but we see it um, obviously quite a bit. So it's really interesting, I think. Um, yeah, just to see how these manifestations uh, can come about and, and what kind of diagnoses that these patients have. And so now that we've talked about some of the top genes out there in the literature that are associated with cerebral palsy, I wanna take a moment to discuss the research that we did at Columbia, what we found out. And so again, we were trying to understand which patients with cerebral palsy benefit the most from genetic testing. 
And so if you remember, I had mentioned before, um, especially with a couple of the cohorts on that page talking about diagnostic rates, that a lot of the studies out there will select patients in cerebral palsy cohorts for patients that have no known etiology. Um, and in a way, it makes sense because you would expect that we don't know why they have CP, so let's do some genetic testing. But our question for our research team was, is there a difference of rate of causative genetic variance from whole exome sequencing in individuals with and without environmental risk factors? So essentially, we're wondering, what if we have an unselected cohort? What if we don't uh, enroll based on whether they've had an environmental etiology or not? What if we, what if it doesn't matter? What if we also take patients with an environmental etiology, so potentially a known environmental cause and see what their diagnostic rates are like? And what if we compare those two groups and is there actually a difference? And so based on what we know, based on even what I've talked about, our hypothesis was that the individuals with no known risk factors, no environmental etiology, would have a significantly higher diagnostic yield from whole exome sequencing than patients that did have risk factors associated with CP. And so we recruited, um, an, again, unselected cohort of patients. This was from the Weinberg Family Cerebral Palsy Center, but also clinics across Columbia, not necessarily just the Cerebral Palsy Center. We performed research whole exome sequencing. We retrospectively looked at the medical record to see if uh, we can evaluate for those risk factors, those environmental risk factors, maturity, brain bleeder, stroke, birth asphyxia, brain malformations, and intrauterine infection. And in cases where it wasn't clear from the medical record, we did um, call the patients and ask targeted questions to try and understand if there was any known environmental etiology. We interpreted the whole exome sequencing based on our protocol that we use at the Institute for Genomic Medicine by, based on Zoo et al. 2015, and this is a genotype first approach to whole exome sequencing analysis. We had 152 participants. The average age was about 25. This is something that I do want to point out um, that our cohorts use a little bit older. Um, again, a lot of the cohorts will include a lot of pediatric patients. We have many adult patients in our cohort. Uh, males and females were pretty evenly divided. We had about 80% of patients with risk factors. I should say 80% of the cohort did have environmental risk factors. About 20% did not have risk factors. And my understanding from looking at cerebral palsy registries, other studies, is that this is a pretty accurate breakdown for the general um, population of patients with CP. So this is not really skewed in any way. This is about what we find. And so the results were not what we expected. There was not a significant difference in the diagnostic rate between individuals with and without risk factors for CP. So as expected, the diagnostic rate in patients with no known environmental etiology was higher um, than those with risk factors at 14.3% versus 8.1%. But this was not a significant p-value. Um, and on top of that, I mean, even the fact that in patients with an environmental etiology, uh, a quote unquote known etiology, there was still diagnosed um, genetic diagnoses in 8% of these patients. That's way more than we expected. The ones that are highlighted um, are ones that were not associated with CP prior to our paper. Um, so yeah, just not what we expected. We also did um, confirm a correlation, which as I described before, has, has been reported of a higher diagnostic rate in patients that also had developmental delay in intellectual disability, as well as movement uh, manifestations for their CP. And so our conclusion from this, um, you know, seeing that our diagnostic rate was so high in patients with risk factors and that there wasn't a significant difference between the groups is that it may be a good idea to consider genetic testing, even in patients that have 
a, again, quote unquote, known environmental ideology um, or who have had some sort of birth trauma because we're seeing that there is in fact genetic diagnoses in, in these patients. And the second part of this conclusion, and this is really um, something that needs to be studied further and just kind of um, a new and interesting perspective that we learned from this is that, you know, we wonder if the fact that patients that have genetic diagnoses, um, or I should say have environmental risk factors also have these genetic diagnoses, we wonder if having the genetic diagnosis or having a pathogenic variant in a, in a gene might be conferring a susceptibility to cerebral palsy in patients with this birth trauma. Um, this obviously would have, there's a lot more studying to do here. This would have a lot to do with complex disorders and put potentially genetic modifiers, but we really wonder um, if having a pathogenic variant is, is making someone more susceptible to CP, to put it in very basic terms. It was really interesting. And so putting everything I just said together, there are some red flags for genetic CP. So this is where if you're seeing a patient in clinic and wondering if you should be looking for a genetic etiology or order genetic testing, these are some of the things to think about. So first of all, a late onset of symptoms. Um, again, like I said, from remember this definition of cerebral palsy, this is a insult to the brain that is from birth or from before birth. So this damage has been done early on. So we don't normally see normal um, development and then an onset of symptoms in cerebral palsy with an environmental etiology. So this is something that is a red flag potentially for a genetic etiology. This makes me think of the MECP2 variants. Number two is regression. Um, and remember this, again, from this definition of CP, CP from an environmental etiology is, is not um, progressive, it, it doesn't regress. And so this is, uh, this makes me think of the hereditary spastic paraplegias. If you see movement spasticity that's getting worse over time, this is also a red flag for a genetic CP. An inconsistent clinical course, again, this, this damage to the brain is done. We don't normally see a fluctuation in movement disorder. And so, um, for example, if you see that movement is worsening based on time of day, based on whether the patient is fasting, um, this might be a red flag, say for a metabolic disorder or something. Isolated motor symptoms. So if you see specifically a spasticity, or sorry, I should say a hypotonia or ataxia, without spasticity and without dystonia, this is something that may be a genetic red flag. Eye abnormalities is not something that we see in CP with an environmental etiology. And so if you see things like oculomotor apraxia, nystagmus, strabismus, this may be um, an indication for a genetic etiology. A normal brain MRI. And that's because uh, from my understanding, there is a certain MRI, MRI pattern that you will see in patients with CP. Um, and so if the, because again, there's been this insult to the brain um, either before birth or during. And so if the brain MRI is totally normal, this may be a reason to look for a genetic etiology. Family history. Um, I know this is something that I really don't need to harp on in this audience, but if you see siblings, um, inheritance patterns of other patients with neurological symptoms that that look like it might be familial, um, definitely a reason to do genetic testing. And then again, and finally, if there's no known risk factors, if there was no environmental etiology, definitely a red flag for a potential genetic etiology. And this is a clinical workup for CP that I would recommend, just to be clear before I um, say more, there is no official guidelines um, for a genetic testing workup for a patient with cerebral palsy, they don't exist. Um, this is something that I, I know there are groups that are working on this. This was adapted from Pearson at all 2019. Um, it's not official in any way, but I think this is a good suggestion. 
So obviously we want to take a thorough clinical exam and family history. If that is pretty normal, um, you want to go on to a brain MRI. And so if the brain MRI is abnormal and looks like these CP findings that you would expect, maybe we can stop there um, because if they had a birth trauma and also the brain MRI looks like a patient with CP, it's probably okay. Um, or if it's an abnormal brain MRI that looks like a specific genetic disorder, probably you can go right there and, and do genetic testing based on those MRI findings. If the MRI is just normal or it's not really specific to anything, I would recommend going on and doing biochemical studies based on the phenotype uh, to see if there might be any potential metabolic disorder. And then finally, if you're still not gathering any information from this workup, then you can move on to genetic testing, a multi-gene panel, or whole exome sequencing based on phenotype, which I'll talk about in a moment. So here's a potential genetic testing workup for CP. Um, I have both clinical and research here because, again, the genetics of CP is something that's still being studied. It's so new that there is a lot of research still being done, and there are options for that. And so let's start with clinical um, targeted testing is something that I would recommend if you have a really good idea of what it might be. And I think a good example is like a metabolic disorder. If you have a certain um, biochemical study finding and you have a certain um, differential of a specific gene, that might be okay to order that targeted testing. Microarray analysis, I haven't talked about this yet in this presentation, um, but there are studies out there showing the benefit of microarray analysis. And in fact, it's about a 10 to 15% diagnostic rate in patients who with CP who have microarray analysis. Um, and so really, uh, if you were to take this 14% that I'm quoting as a potential diagnostic rate in patients with CP, if you add on microarray, that really adds up to about 20, 25% um, if once we add that on. And so just as microarray testing is a first line test for patients with developmental delay or intellectual disability, same with CP. If you see a patient with CP with isolated developmental delay and intellectual disability, no other syndromic features, um, it's probably a good idea to do a microarray because that data is out there. Multi-gene panels are a good idea um, if you have an idea of the type of disorder. Again, a really good example is the hereditary spastic paraplegias. If you see uh, that progressive spasticity, if you feel like it might be hereditary spastic paraplegia, this is a good uh, way to go for it. There are plenty of hereditary spastic paraplegia panels, other certain condition panels. Um, also, some of the bigger labs do have cerebral palsy panels and those panels are anywhere from, you know, 100 to 300 genes, I think at this time. Or then of course, if none of this is fruitful or the patient is just very nonspecific in their manifestation, you can move on to whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing. And moving on to research, um, there is sponsored testing out there from major labs that are trying to research the genetics of cerebral palsy. And this is the case where it's free to the patient um, so that they can use the data for research. And then whole exome sequencing. Um, I work for Columbia, so I know that we have our whole exome sequencing research study specifically. Um, I don't know about others necessarily. Um, to get into our study at Columbia, the patient needs to be a patient at Columbia. And that's pretty much the, um, the inclusion criteria. And so this is the last slide. Um, I do have cases in here, just in case we were running low on time, or I guess short on time. We had much more time, but I think that this is a good place to stop before, um, and, and instead of moving on to cases. So this is about supporting our patients. Um, this is a statement that came out from the International Genetic Consortium um, for Cerebral Palsy. Um, which they published in McLennan et al. 2009. 
So the statement says identifying genetic etiologies or any other specific etiology should not change the clinical diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And individuals with this diagnosis should continue to be included in cerebral palsy registries and receive the rehabilitation, healthcare, financial, and social support that they and their families deserve. And I really wanted to put this in here. Um, first of all, this is a statement again by the International Cerebral Palsy Genomics Consortium. Um, also because I want to make a point as I end this that the diagnosis of cerebral palsy and a genetic diagnosis, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, a patient can certainly have both. And I would just like to discourage people from using the word misdiagnosis um, in a patient where the patient has had cerebral palsy, a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, and then suddenly they have a genetic diagnosis. Um, I would encourage people to use the terminology um, of a genetic etiology. So by doing genetic testing and finding that there's a genetic diagnosis, we have just found a genetic etiology for their CP and not necessarily um, a different or misdiagnosis. And so again, um, going back to that definition, for much of the definition, cerebral palsy, this is a clinical diagnosis. And so it's clinically diagnosed based on the fact that it is permanent, it's not treatable. And so, you know, if the patient meets these criteria, uh, many of these criteria, then they still have cerebral palsy, even if they have a genetic diagnosis, and we've just found out why they have cerebral palsy. Um, I think it's important to understand that as far as counseling and the psychosocial aspect of this, that many of these patients are diagnosed very young. Cerebral palsy is usually diagnosed as young as two years old. And so, you know, the patients identify as someone with cerebral palsy, and this is a community that they belong to. And so by the time many of them get to genetic testing and receive a genetic diagnosis much later in life, even if they are an older um, child under 18 still, this is, this can be hurtful, I think, to rip away this identity and this diagnosis that they've always had. And so um, it is the current recommendation that identifying a genetic etiology doesn't change the clinical diagnosis. Um, they can have both. And this is something that I just wanted to throw out there because I didn't, before um, attending the International Cerebral Palsy Genetics Consortium, before really learning from other people in the field on the cerebral palsy side, because I'm so used to the genetic side as are many of us, um, this is something that I hadn't thought of before. But I think that this is something where the two sides of this patient's diagnosis, the, the clinical orthopedic side and the genetic side can come together and really collaborate um, to support these patients. And at that, um, I will finish for now and take any questions. Sure. Uh, Haley, it looks like we have one question here in the Q&A so far. It says, genes associated with genetic CP, um, how often do they have alterations and mutations in these genes when there's no clinical signs of CP present um, in that patient? So I guess just thinking kind of backwards for patients who might uh, be undergoing some testing, revealed to have a potential you know, uh, variant there, and then they may not show signs of CP or have that diagnosis yet. Um, I don't know that I've come across the number. So my understanding is that the question is how often will you see a diagnosis in patients where they, they don't have the clinical manifestations of CP yet? Um, yes, I believe so. Yeah. I honestly, I'm not sure. That's not something I've looked into just because I've, in my own research, been focused on um, cohorts of patients that do display clinical manifestations of CP and a clinical diagnosis of CP. I think that'd be a really interesting thing um, to try and understand though. We have another question that says, is there any data gathered on the percentage of patients who were found to have a genetic etiology and had changes in their medical treatment based on those genetic testing results? So that's, that's a great question. I don't, I don't think it's out there, but I am actually part of a, a current collaboration where, where we are 
looking at the outcome interventions um, based on genetic variants in patients with CP and yeah, and what those outcome interventions are. And so this is a paper that we expect will be published in the next year or two. And so it is something that we're, we're working on. And I, I don't have numbers yet, but I can say that there are more than we expected, actually. There are quite a few outcome interventions. That's interesting. Um, another question that we have here is, you know, when you think about discussions surrounding variants of uncertain significance in the genes associated with CP, um, you know, how might that conversation look like for affected individuals and their families? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would imagine that I, I haven't given back any VUS results um, personally for patients with CP. I would imagine um, that like a lot of clinical areas of genetic counseling, you, you definitely can't change treatment based on it. Um, and especially because the data is so new and so small, there's not a whole lot out there. I don't think you can put a lot of stake in a VUS. I think that you would need to counsel um, that it's essentially, we have not found a cause for the cerebral palsy um, until we know more information, but that's a really good question. Like we have another one um, referencing the Australian study that came up with the 40% heritability rate um, did that particular study account for the differences in the pregnancy complication rates um, between the MZ and DZ pregnancies? Um, and they just referenced that MZ pregnancies are at much higher risk of complications that can lead to uh, features of CP. Um, just thinking you know, in regards to that study, it could have been measuring differences in pregnancy complications rather than the underlying genetic differences. Yeah, um, they did actually. Um... I remember reading that and they did take into account the higher instances of complications in MZ, yeah. Do you have any suggestions or um, thoughts of you know, how best we might get genetic counselors integrated into testing um, you know, patients um, within these you know, neurology clinics or if there's these specialty clinics um, regarding CP? I don't know of any specialty clinics. Um, I would actually, it's, I would, one of my goals is to start a CP genetics clinic at Columbia. That's something that I want to work on in, in the next year or so, but I don't know of any other one that exists. Although actually that's not true. Um, I believe KKI might have a, a genetic, a cerebral palsy genetics clinic, but that's not something that I can quote for sure. Um, I think it's rare. I think that probably the best um, solution is to refer the patients to clinical genetics. I mean, they have the best idea of, of what to work up for most, you know, for any patient. So I think right now that's the best that we can do as genetic counselors is refer them to clinical genetics. Another question had come in and says the genes associated with CP are these genes predominantly expressed in the CNS? Yeah, I think for the most part they are. Um, yes. I think that's the majority of our questions that have um, come in today. It looks like we just got another and said, where are these patients typically found in neurology, orthopedics, um, in care, nursing homes, etc." For our study, they were referred from the cerebral palsy clinic, um, neurology, clinical genetics, and even sometimes the PQ, like truly across different departments at Columbia. Uh, for the other studies that I've come across, I think they're normally neurology clinics. Um, actually, I think usually neurology or genetics clinics. I don't think that I've seen a lot of other papers where it's orthopedics specifically, um, although some of our cohort was. I, I don't think that's generally what we see. I think it's mostly neurology and um, neurology, pediatric neurology, and 
I totally forgot my train of thought of what I just said, but yeah, not, not so much orthopedics. I do have one question um, while I allow other people to submit their questions um, and give them time to put that in the Q&A or the chat. Um, in regards to um, some of the genes that you had identified from you guys' research, you know, such as ATM, this is not something, you know, we typically think of, of um, going along with CP, you know, working in uh, pediatrics or in a neurology clinic. Um, you know, is there any thought for how we might broaden our overall view for genes that are associated with CP and kind of change our thought process behind that? And we're thinking more of it, I guess, going for a differential diagnosis, if you will. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I think the perspective that I have taken is, is usually patients that have already been diagnosed with CP um, and then trying to figure out what the genetic etiology might be as far as if you see a patient and I don't know if this is if this is really answering the question but if you see a patient for example with that ataxia coming in I don't know the reverse of that like I, I don't know that I can comment on whether we would classify them as having CP or not um, I don't think so I think that Mainly, this is for patients that already have a diagnosis of CP, um, just understanding where there might be a genetic etiology. I think as far as um, that specific example, a patient with ATM, you might, the, the red flag there would be uh, some of the other manifestations that come along with the ataxia. That would be a reason to think that there's a genetic etiology. Specifically, I find things actually. Um, it looks like that may be all of our questions. Just seeing if there's um, any that might come in. One like logistics question for individuals who have a diagnosis of CP and we're considering testing. Um, do you think it's more appropriate to consider one of these more specific panels in your experience or to consider exome uh, sequencing, for example? I think that probably one of the panels at the moment will cover everything that's been associated with CP, even as a candidate gene. So I don't see the necessity for doing whole exome sequencing first. Awesome. Well, thank you for answering our questions today. I think at this time, um, you know, we can conclude today's member webinar. And on behalf of the NSGC webinar subcommittee, thank you all for attending. And a huge thank you to Haley, our speaker, for sharing her experience and expertise. And this webinar recording will be posted uh, to the webinar page of the NSGC website within the next 48 hours. Thank you all. Thank you.